Greetings, unsettled souls, and welcome to the correct views. Sam I B Deganji reporting for the media speaks. Needless to say, guys, tons of news to get to today. I want to thank you very much for tuning in. We're going to zip right into it because uh, there's a lot to cover today. I'm like swarmed with a little bit of everything. Um, I do want to get a little bit of some of this ISIS and uh, Islamic slash France news reporting here. Three million copies of Charlie Hebdo to feature Mohammed, Mohammed cartoons. Now, Christelle, as my loving girlfriend, were you very happy to hear what I did? As my girlfriend. Quickly. I'm unsure. All right. As a, a part of this show, were you happy with what I did? Yes. I posted the uh, Mohammed French kiss on my website. Listen to this, friends, at news.yahoo.com Paris. This week's Three million copies of Charlie Hebdo, the first post-attack issue of the French Satirical Weekly, which is like Mad Magazine, will defiantly feature characters of Prophet Muhammad, its lawyer said Monday. Now, let me mention real quick, I went to junior high school with Brian Warner, and do you know who that is, Christelle? Yes, Marilyn Manson. Yes, it is. And uh, I, I'm going to be dead honest, I don't remember him as much as I wish I would have. I know that he did a, I know that I, we got along, we weren't like best friends. I know he did something to somebody that I was friends with that I didn't like. But I do remember that Brian and I always got along. My point being in all of this, when you censor someone, you make them bigger. Uh, Christelle, she's a little younger than I am. What happened in the uh, late 90s when they attempted to demonize Marilyn Manson? Did he sell less records? No. No, he sold a lot more records. You now hear beautiful people at the Cavs game. You hear it when they're losing, don't you? <laughs> she's a Cavs fan. All right, uh, you hear it when they're losing. You hear it when they're winning. You hear it every. It's like Crazy Train by Ozzy. Tried to censor Ozzy? Crazy Train. Bam. Tried to censor Marilyn Manson? Everybody hears beautiful people when their team is winning and as Cavs fans know when they're losing. Um, it's the same thing here. They've now sold three million copies of their magazine thanks to you Islamic fundamentalist morons. And again, I I'm Christian and I know that it was a Christians that tried to censor Manson. I, not, I was not one of them. Uh, you, again, I'm not happy that my old friend Brian is satanic, but I do support his uh, American right to be so. The special issue to come out on Wednesday will also be offered in 16 languages for readers around the world, one of its communist Patrick's Pillow said. 16 languages. Christelle, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that it was in 16 languages before the shooting. No, I've never heard of it before, did you? No. The two gunmen who slaughtered 12 people in their attack on Charlie Hebdo's offices last Wednesday, including five of its top cartoonists and three other staff members, claimed as they left the scene that they had avenged the Prophet Muhammad. They should have shouted, We have just sold three million copies of this magazine! The 44-year-old newspaper has always sought to break taboos with its provocative cartoons on all religions, current events, and prominent personalities. Um, thank you, Isis, uh, for being an idiot and for selling. You know what? <laughs> what we need to do is find a way to further every agenda that Isis tries to hurt. I'm dead serious. Uh, the, the, the last time anybody protested a Marilyn Manson concert was about 10 years ago. Guess what? I wish he was selling more copies. Not because I'm a Satanist, I'm not, but because his music is good. You know why he's not? Because nobody is picketing it. Maybe we need to get ISIS to picket the Marilyn Manson concert. Can we do this, Christelle? I have no clue. Let's get ISIS members to picket the Marilyn Manson concert and have him drop his new CD like on Ramadan. It's just a thought. All right, Kurt Nemo, Prison Planet, Islamic State prepares to slaughter Christians in Libya. Um, not going to, uh, again, I, I'm not making light of people dying, but friends, 
if if I give you the news and I report it like I was uh, a caretaker, you're not gonna listen. Uh, none of this is funny. But if you don't have a little bit of gallows humor, then all you have is gallows, okay? So work with me here. The overriding agenda of ISIS or the Islamic State is not to proselytize or establish a Sharia state. It is designed to inflame the West and push for neo-conversions of a clash of civilizations. This is an interesting take. Christelle, what they're saying is that there maybe this isn't about Christians in the West versus Middle Easterners and Islam. Maybe it's about taking the worst Christians, like the Westboro Baptist people, and the worst of Islam, like the terrorists, and seeing if you can get those two factions to get the normal people to fight. It says the end game is a war between Christians and Muslims that will allow the global elite to reorder the Middle East and resource rich Africa. In other words, the oil and minerals that are in Africa, which is unfortunately largely Islamic. It will also usher in decades of war profitable to core industries, including the so-called security sector, now building a police state surveillance grid in the West and the military industrial complex. The ISIS and radical jihadi meme continually introduces new horrors and outrages to be consumed. For instance, on the heels of the brazen attack, it says, on the offices of Charlie Hebdo in Paris, a story about the kidnapping and the eventual execution of over 20 Coptic Christians surfaced. This is from the Telegraph. On January the 3rd, Christian activists in Egypt had reported 13 of their countrymen kidnapped in the Libyan town of Sirte, and that seven others had been kidnapped earlier. Interesting side note here. Um, prior to us going into Iraq, let's face it, there were a lot of problems there. Christelle, do you remember us having any problems whatsoever under Saddam Hussein, which were bad, compared to what we have now? No. In late December, an Egyptian Coptic couple and their daughter were found dead in the town, well known before the, 11, the 2011 civil war, which led to the current fragmentation of the country as the birthplace and the stronghold of Muammar Gaddafi, the longtime dictator. Uh, in other words, I, and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I said Saddam Hussein. I meant um, uh, Muammar Gaddafi. Um, Muammar Gaddafi was not a capitalist savior, okay? He was not a genuinely great person, but he was someone who stayed mostly true to his Islamic faith. Um, he got out of line for a while. Reagan promptly bombed his ass into submission, and uh, it was a, a, not a war, but a strike that Reagan won, whether you're for it or against it. And after that, and I was in the seventh grade, so it was a while ago, after that, largely, he was very, very good at keeping the Christians and the Muslims of which there are many factions of Muslims, living in peace. So the Shiites and the Sunnis weren't bombing each other. They were pretty much leaving the Christians alone. Was it a great place to live if you weren't Islamic? No. Was it probably the best place to live if you weren't Islamic? Yes. And we ruined it. And now what we have there is a, a horrible aspect. It says... Uh, the likelihood is that ISIS-affiliated terrorists will make terrorists will make a big theatrical production out of slaughtering and beheading Christians. Its victims will add more fuel to the anti-Islam sentiment growing in Europe, not only among right-wing immigration groups, but much of the population as a whole. In other words, Christelle, keeping us fighting. And uh, do you remember the Treaty of Versailles, Christelle, by any chance at all? All right, the Treaty of Versailles ended World War One. And what it did, Christelle, it led to there being an extreme un, uh, limiting of rights and trade agreements for people that lived in Germany because Germany was seen as the people that started World War I. Now, after World War I, Christelle, guess who came into popularity because of how stringent the Treaty of Versailles was? Hitler. I was, I was thinking that. 
Now let's 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 change the names. In 2015, feels weird to say. In 2015, what are we in fact looking at? We are looking at a number of Islamists who are pressuring the people who are native to Europe to fight against all things Islam and to perpetuate a war, which sounds a lot, Christelle, do you agree, with different, it's not, it's not Jews now, it's not Germans, it's Islamists, but isn't this exactly what we saw at the end of the Treaty of Versailles, which led to Hitler? So, it sounds really wouldn't we be looking, perhaps, at, in fact, another Hitler? Not one that has Jews in concentrations camps, but somebody just as evil, coming out of Europe just like came out of Europe the last time this happened. All right, friends. I mean, the only reason Christelle stayed in the room, she's probably going to leave after this. She's been wanting to know about 3D printing, and I wish I could tell you that I knew everything about it, but I really don't. But I do know that there are a number of patents that are expiring. Do you know you can print food? Do you know that you can print a car? Do you know, Christelle, they're trying to make planes that can print a plane? Listen to this. Do you know what that'll do for warfare? Listen to this. 3D printing could revolutionize war and foreign policy. 3D printing, it says, will revolutionize, guess what? War and foreign policy, says experts. Not only by making possible incredible new designs, but by turning the defense industry and possibly the entire global economy on its head. It says, for many, 3D printing still looks like a gimmick used for printing useless plastic figurines and not much else. But with key patents uh, running out this year, new printers that use metal, wood, and fabric are said to become much more widely available, putting the engineering world on the cusp of a magical, major historical change. This is going to be like the inventing, inventing of the printing press, Christelle. It says the billion-dollar defense industry is at the bleeding edge of this innovation, with the U.S. military already investing heavily in efforts to print uniforms, synthetic skin to treat battle wounds, and even food, says Alex Chavalsky, the analyst of IHS Technology. Now, Christelle, what did you ask earlier? How do you do that? Well, guys, I don't think we can do it with uh, with what the analogy I'm going to give Chris. I gave Christelle earlier because hydrogen is explosive. So I'm speaking in what Glenn Beck, ben Glenn Beck calls the safety tree. I'm not saying you can print water. That's not what I'm saying. Let's just pretend that you can. You know that you need hydrogen. You know that you need water. You put the right elements in, and they have printed water. Now, again, it doesn't work because hydrogen is explosive, but that's what they're doing here. What goes into a uniform? What blood type are you? What's, what goes into your skin? You put those elements into the printer, and you print it. This is mind-blowing to me. It says scientists at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology have already invented 4D printing, creating materials that change when they come into contact with elements such as water. One day, that could mean things like printed uniforms that change color depending on their environment. In the real world, the baby steps are already being taken. It says, last year, British defense term BAE, B-A-E, systems put the first printed metal into a tornado jet fighter. It's not even a, a, a transportation plane, Christelle. It's a jet fighter. The company recently put out an animated video showing where they think that such humble beginnings could one day lead. It imagined a plane printing another plane inside itself and then launching it from its undercarriage. 
Christelle, that would mean you could print the plane and send them down. You'd have one guy up top that's way above where most bombs could reach, and he would be printing planes that don't have a driver like drones, that have the mechanisms that were put into it based on the materials that were taught to it from the mother plane. And this won't be used against us. Not a chance. It says it's long-term, but it's certainly our end goal to manufacture an aerial vehicle that is entirely using 3D printing technology, says Matt Stevens, who heads Bay's 3D printing division. It says revolutionizing both war and politics. How politics? Listen. It says the real revolution of 3D printing is less about the things that you can make and more about where you can make them. Being able to take printers to a war zone promises a radical shakeup of combat in the defense industry, says Peter W. Singer, an expert in future warfare in the North American Foundation. He says defense contractors want to sell you an item so that, and also want to own the supply chain for 50 years. In other words, Christelle, you need an, a number of AK-47s and some Sherman tanks, so... You're going to call them, and they're going to give you so many, but you have to buy them from them, because that's the only place you can get them. Well, what if you could print them? Now you'll have soldiers in an Astaire outpost in somewhere like Afghanistan who can pull down the software for a spare part, tweak the design, and print it out. This could lead militaries to cut out private, def private defense companies private defense companies altogether. And by combining 3D printing with assembly line robotics, those that remain will be enormously, stre enormously streamlined. So you could argue it's going to make war less likely because it's going to take all the money away from the defense contractors. You could also argue that it's going to make war more inviting because it makes it cheaper. Which way is it going to go? It says, uh, she shrugged, that's not helping me on air. That sort of disruption carries huge political ramifications in places like the U.S., where defense systems are purposefully spread around the country and support millions of jobs. The Pentagon and defense industry have an incredibly tough time with innovation, but you don't want to wait to lose a major battle before you do it, says Singer. 3D printing could even change foreign policy, for instance, by undermining sanctions. The U.S. has sanctioned everything from fighter jet spare parts to oil equipment. 3D printing could turn the sanctions off, which would have a crucial part of foreign policy. In other words, we tell Russia that they can't buy our new oil uh, refinery system so they get the schematics and they print it we can't do anything about it it said the recent upsurge in interest is tied to the fact that patents of the original technology are expiring we have known how to do this since the 80s the 80s it said the first major patents to run out were in 09 for a system that used plastics known as fused deposition modeling. In other words, Christelle, the rules that stopped people from doing this are gone, and we're going to be printing all kinds of things. It's possible that you could print a house. Oh, that would be nice. That would be a, an interesting house. Do you ever see that house in California that has the steps that don't go anywhere? All right, friends, foxnews.com, California's chicken cage size law expected to increase egg prices. I don't know about you, but I, for one, the Christelle, do you mind spending more money because the eggs are more expensive because they're not kept in little tiny cages anymore? They're actually in California. You have to let them have enough room to move and stretch their wings, but it's going to cost you 20 cents more per dozen. Exactly. And thankfully, friends, that's happening. Fresno Cali, the new year is expected to bring raising chicken egg prices across the U.S. as California starts requiring farmers to house hens in cages with enough space to move around and stretch their wings. The new standard backed by animal rights advocates has drawn ire nationwide because farmers in Iowa, Ohio, and other states who sell eggs in California have to abide by the same requirements. 
What kind of sick bastard would not be in favor of this? Yes, I will happily pay a little bit more so that the chickens can turn around and spread their wings. Come on, man. Even the Bible says a man is to respect his beast. Come on. It says to comply, farmers have to put fewer hens into each cage or invest in revamped hen houses. Replacing hen houses that they should have never been allowed to grow a chicken in. Passing along the expense to consumers shopping at grocery stores. That, you know what? Anybody that does this without wanting to do it, I wish I knew who they were. I wouldn't even shop there. This is a wonderful news, and I'm not in favor of very much the California does. I happen to think that Governor Jerry Brown is the worst governor in all of recorded history. And well, again, you could argue uh, Taft in uh, Ohio a few years ago, but this is a good call, people. And again, I happen to think the same thing of Jerry Brown that uh, Jello does in uh, Dead Kennedys, California Uber Alice Sig Heil, but. This is a good thing. Who would be against that? Friends, you're listening to The Correct Views. Got three more stories left for you. Don't zone out. I just want to invite you, before I get to them, to check out the work of Mike McLaughlin. He is an excellent writer. And you can find his work by looking up Mike McLaughlin on Facebook.com. Let him know you heard about his works from The Correct Views. And then make sure you uh, purchase something. Read the work that he's already got posted on his site free. The man is a great writer. And let him know you heard about it from the correct views. Friends, three more stories as promised to get to the register.co.uk. Alien Earth! Red Sun's habitable world spotted 470 light years away. This is the only science story that I'm going to get to tonight. But as many of you know, especially if you watch the Saturday edition on uh, 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, mediaspeaks.com. Um, you can also find them on Facebook. I have a section on their show called the News from the F Science Front. <clears throat> and on our show, I cover anything even remotely science-related. This is one... I'm just getting swarmed. This is one that isn't going to be on that show, so I wanted to mention it here. It says, The discovery of new planets likely to be able to support life along earthly lines has been announced. With one of the most promising candidates for alien and or human habit habitability <laughs> habitability located 470 light years away. It says the new exoplanets have been discovered by analysis of data from the Kepler Space Telescope and bear the tags Kepler 438b and Kepler 442b. Another, it says, six Earth-like worlds have also been identified, but these two are considered to be the most promising, and Kepler-438, it says, is the best of the lot. The new research was announced yesterday, and it, again, as many of you that have followed me on uh, news from the science front at the Media Speaks at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every Saturday, um, there's a number of things going on that are extremely interesting in this regard, but this is one of the most interesting. We're soon going to be able to actually have um, computers that can print out what the planet looks like without uh, an artist needing to do it. For those of you that don't know, when they find a new world now, they'll, they'll know by the color spectrum roughly what the world is made out of. So then they will hire an, hire an artist to draw out what that world likely is. Well, with the new technology soon, you won't need to do that. The, the layout of the planet <clears throat> will be given to you in the way that the color spectrum is given to the telescope. And this is one of the planets I guarantee you that they're going to be looking at when that becomes a reality. It says, both worlds orbit red dwarf stars, smaller and less hot than our sun. Kepler-438b has a 35 Earth day year. Kepler-442b's year is 112 days long. With a diameter of 12% bigger than Earth, Kepler-438b has a 70% chance of being rocky, according to the team's calculations. Kepler-442b is about one-third larger than Earth, but still has a 60% chance of being rocky. 
Friends, they're finding a lot of these worlds that are pointing to the fact that while I do believe wholeheartedly that the God of the Bible loved the earth very much, I don't believe that we were the only people that he loved. <clears throat> I think there are other planets out there that have life. It says, we don't know for sure whether any of the planets in our sample are truly habitable, explains David Kipping. So they're not, they're not uh, going ahead and trying to oversell this. It says, all that we can say is that they are promising candidates. The two worlds <clears throat> and other planets fi figured by Kepler yesterday bring the count to exoplanets known to humanity to a thousand being too small to be identified by mass measurement, only larger planets make their parent stars wobble precipitably from Earth. From these relative tiddlers are visible as they pass. So basically what they're doing, for those of you that tune in for the easy version, and I don't blame you, you have a star. Well, every time a planet goes around it, that star wobbles a little because of the effect of the planet going around it. When that happens, you can measure many, many things from the planet, and by its luminosity of the dim, you can gauge a lot by what the planet is made out of, if you know what you are looking for. Friends, uh, foxnews.com, two more stories to get to here. Oklahoma bill would bar those with a DUI conviction from buying alcohol. On paper, like everything else that the government does, it seems like a good idea, but it isn't. Let me tell you why. Most people that get a DUI are, were never drunk. They were no more danger in any way to any percentage of any kind more danger than somebody that has not been drinking. The only reason they got that was because they redefine what drunk is in order to steal from you when they pull you over. I've preached on this many times. If you want more, let me know in my comment line. I've got all the facts you need to back this up. It says a new proposal, which is utter BS, in Oklahoma would bar drunk drivers from buying or consuming alcohol and already is raising concerns over how it would be enforced. Not to mention the last time we uh, tried alcohol prohibition in this country, it led to Al Capone. Um, how well is weed prohibition working? Anybody, anybody at all think it's working great? Ah, uh, no. Fox 25 in Oklahoma City reports that State Senator Patrick Anderson is proposing a bill that would allow a judge to enforce the alcohol restrictions on anyone with a DUI charge for a set period of time. And how many of you know that the government, according to the Constitution, has no right to force medical treatment upon anybody? Therefore, they do have the right to ticket you or to say that you cannot drive under their statutes, which shouldn't even be there. They have no right to force medical treatment upon anyone. It says further, it could end up punishing those caught buying alcohol for someone subject to those restrictions, of course, because that's how they steal. Defense attorney Richard Roth had described the measure as a needed deterrent to stop repeat offenders from drunk driving. Yeah, because the last time we tried alcohol prohibition, nobody drank in speakeasies at all. This is a deterrent, and there must be something done. Yeah, because something is absolutely going to work, because this moron Roth thinks it will. It says, keep in mind the consumption of alcohol has never been illegal unless you were underage. Well, that's not true. We just pointed out to when it was illegal. Friends, that is the stupidest idea I've ever heard of. But let's see if we can find an even dumber one. Can we make Sam hear of something even more dumb? Yes, we can. The dumdy of the day. Truthstreammedia.com brings this to us. Um, this is by Melissa Melton. UK teachers to tattle on toddlers at risk of becoming terrorists. Now, Melissa Melton, I love you. And you're going to wonder, Sam, I came on the Media Speaks. I always reply to your dumb comments on my comment line. Why didn't you make my story the Dunce Cap of the Month Award winner? Because, friends, it costs too much to send, dun too much to send Dunce Caps overseas. 
Um, you can donate to the show at the correct views at hotmail.com. And if I get enough money and uh, donations, I can do something. As it stands, I only send out dunce caps to the U.S. Having said that, Cristal happily has chosen this as dunce cap of the month. And if I was sending out international dunce caps, it might in fact be the case. Just three years ago, we found out that children in Britain as young as three could be blacklisted, labeled racist on their permanent file for such evil thought crimes as calling a fellow classmate a broccoli head. As we know, all terrorists do in fact use words like broccoli head, I guess. When my brother was six and I was 12, he called me a carnival head. I always thought it was because I was being a six-year-old little brother. I never knew until 